to continue our study looking at John's Gospel. I've entitled the message this morning, Behold Your King. So we've seen up until now the, the courtroom dramas, people trying to pin something on Jesus. And the question is, is what was Jesus Christ's crime? They'd all had a go at trying to get something on him. Annas, Caiaphas, Herod, couldn't find anything wrong with this man. And as we've saw, mentioned last week, Pilate famously says three times, I find no guilt in him. The reason that he finds no guilt in Jesus is because there was nothing to find, because he was the spotless one, the one who'd never done anything wrong. And what we see is when they finally crucify him, when they finally put the notice up on his cross, indicating the crime that this criminal had committed, which was written there in Aramaic and Latin and in Greek, so that everyone could read it. What's the crime that's written? Have a look at verse 20. This is his crime. Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That was his crime. Jesus was actually condemned for telling the truth. Because his name was Jesus. He was from Nazareth. And he was the king of the Jews. So even in, in that statement was, was backing up that Jesus is the king of the Jews. That he's the, the one who speaks the truth. In our passage here, we see this word king coming up eight times in the passage that we, we've just read. So what sort of king was Jesus Christ? What sort of king is Jesus Christ? Well, the first thing I want to bring out this morning is that he's a servant king. Have a look at uh, verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their, their hands. We see something of the cruelty and the barbarity of human beings here is the, the guards dress him up and mock him as if they're paying tribute to Caesar. Hail the king of the Jews. You know, something desperately wicked about the, the Roman soldiers, apparently particularly historians have said from those in Jerusalem that they used to, you know, they would dress criminals up and they'd even play large board games with them as a way of mocking them and, and just having fun with them. You know, when restraints are lifted, what's truly in your heart comes forth. They were in a position of power. They could do what they wanted. And this is what they, they did with victims of crime. They probably justified, thought in their heads, these people deserve it. But with Jesus Christ, they'd done nothing wrong. And there they are, playing with him. And mocking him. You know, it's easy for us to get swept along with the crowd. It's easy for us to be in a certain situation where perhaps the restraints are lifted. And when that happens, that's truly the test of what's inside you as a human being. I, was, I always remember being shocked in 2011. Do you remember we had some riots in Manchester and, you know, you could blame it on, on the teenage lads going out and smashing everything up and, and looting. Which, you know, they probably started it, a lot of them. But the thing that shocked me, and I suppose it shouldn't shock me really, was respectable people. When they're walking down the, the high street and they see these shops with the windows smashed up, they actually thought, I'm going to go in and help myself to that pair of jeans that's too expensive, or that pair of trainers, or that dress, or that jewellery. Or those watches. Respectable people who are meant to be showing others how to behave in society. But yet when the constraints are lifted off, the restraints gone, what's truly in their heart comes forth. You know, a child of God wouldn't do that. You might be tempted to do it, but you wouldn't because you couldn't. Because you know that stealing's wrong. And you know that your Heavenly Father sees everything. So it shows what's truly in someone's heart. And Jesus, you know, him being there, 
just passively, was actually revealing to the guards, these soldiers, what was truly in their hearts. He didn't even have to say anything. He just went along with what they wanted to do, with the evil that was in their heart. And that evil was portrayed out for all to see. And it's recorded here in the Bible for us to see. So Jesus, he exposes the heart, but he also, he only exposes the heart so that he can deal with the human heart. And here he is, the perfect one, the one who obeyed God's law completely. And there's two aspects to to Jesus in his obedience. We've got his active obedience in terms of what we perhaps we looked at last week. Jesus obeying all the commands completely that the Lord God had, had stated in the law of God. He was obeying them all. But then there's also his passive obedience, which in a sense is Christ paying the penalty for our sin through his his sacrifice, his laying down of his life. These two aspects actually run right through his life. And he's doing it, he's, he's not only fulfilling the law, but he's taking the punishment of the law as well upon himself for those who break the law so that he might be and is the perfect sacrifice, the perfect saviour. So our text is more on the focus of his passive obedience. He's there in front of the guards, not retaliating, not reacting. uh, Pilate's asking him questions, but he's not coming back to try and justify himself. He's passively laying his life down because this is the way that God's going to bring salvation. And so we read, if you look in verse 14, now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. That's the time when the Passover lambs would be beginning to be sacrificed in Jerusalem as people prepared for the Passover meal. God's perfect timing. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, is there, laying his life down passively so that we might be forgiven. Philippians 2 puts it this way. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by coming a bead by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So Jesus Christ is the servant king, but he's also the king of kings. The guards were blinded. They didn't really see who Jesus was, and therefore their hearts allowed them to mock Jesus. Pilate also was blinded. He perhaps had more light than the guards, but he didn't truly see who Jesus was. And he finds himself in a situation where he's completely trapped by fear. He's there, Pilate knows, he's increasingly comes to this understanding that Jesus Christ is actually innocent. And so he, he has him flogged. He hands him over to the soldiers. They bring him out, this, this poor, wretched man. There, crowned with a crown of thorns, with a, a scarlet robe on bringing him out to the crowd. I guess in some ways he's probably thinking, right, now I've flogged him, now I've humiliated him, surely the crowd will let him go. And they'll just say, okay, enough's enough. You know, he's, he's paid some punishment. Let, let just, let's just let this man get off the hook. But what had Pilate done? We read in verse 7, the Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, He ought to die because he's made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. Now, Pilate didn't believe in God as the Jews believed in God or as we would believe in God. But he believed in the gods. And here's a man who they're saying is the son of God. Has he just had a God flogged? And what does that mean for him? You can see that he's gripped by fear, thinking, I've just, done, I've just you know, done something bad to a higher being. What on earth is going to happen to me? Verse 12, it says, From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. 
So now here's another threat. Here's another thing that ties Pilate in. So not only does he feel like he's perhaps done something to a god, but he's, they're also invoking the name of Caesar, his big boss. And he's thinking, well, what would Caesar think if I caused a riot in Jerusalem over the Passover? What would Caesar think? You know, apparently um, the history books say that when the Allies invaded Normandy on D-Day, Germany lost a lot of time. They should have sent some tanks out to go and get them. But everyone was too scared to wake Hitler up. And we see a similar fear here. But what Pilate should have done is he should have feared God and not man. What he should have done is had his eyes opened and realized that this wasn't just a God, but this was the Son of God, the only God, the only true God, God himself. When we read the book of Daniel, if you remember in the book of Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has this, this dream of a statue, you know, with a golden head and silver and going down to various parts, representing the kingdoms of the world, the mighty kingdoms of the world. Now Rome is included in that statue. Rome is mighty. It wouldn't be long, maybe, you know, 40, less than 40 years or so, that the might of Rome would come into Jerusalem, would destroy the temple, would burn it down, would completely destroy the whole city. This is the might of Rome. But what Pilate hadn't seen, he'd only seen the power of Rome and the fear of Rome. What he hadn't seen is the end of Daniel's prophecy. Let me read this to you from Daniel chapter 2. A stone was cut out, was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and fill the whole earth. All those world empires completely destroyed. Ground to dust in a sense. And blown off by the wind. Never to be seen again. Because of this stone that was uncut by a human hand that came from heaven. That stone, as you know, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate had not seen the power and the majesty of Jesus that he truly is the King of Kings. You know, we all battle ourselves between the fear of God and the fear of, of mankind, the fear of the human beings. You know, fear in man may bring some short-term solution to the problem that you're in, but it will always end in disaster. Fearing God may bring some pain and inconvenience at your, t your life at that time, but it will always pay off in the end. As Jesus put it this way, Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in him. We are to fear Jesus, the righteous judge. Look at verse 13. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. He goes on to say in verse 15, Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? So we see the judge of the most powerful empire at that particular time, sat down on the judgment seat, ready to make a judgment. And he actually asks the crowd what to do. Matthew records these words. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. 
Pilate knew before he sat down that Jesus was innocent. And gents, you should listen to your wives. Yeah? At that moment, they're speaking the truth. He knew without a shadow of a doubt that this man was innocent. And yet, because of self-interest, it says in verse 16 that Pilate delivered him, del delivered him over to them to be crucified. That word delivered there is the same word that's used as Judas betraying Christ. He betrayed Christ at that moment. He knew that Christ was innocent, but yet for self-preservation, for selfish reasons, he betrayed the Lord. He delivered him over to be crucified. It makes us think, doesn't it, when we, you know, we can all be guilty of this, when we put ourselves on the judgment seat, putting the world to rights. They shouldn't be doing this. They definitely shouldn't be doing that. If I was in that situation, I wouldn't do it like this. Do you ever think how flawed human judgment is? No human can make a right judgment. No human knows all the facts. No human knows the hearts and the intentions of the person as to why they were doing that. We need to be careful of not putting ourselves in that position and pronouncing judgments. Only God himself can make righteous judgments and can truly say what's right and wrong and can have the power and authority to bring forth the right judgment without fearing or cowering to the fear of man. You know, the roles would be reversed. Still yet to be. Pilate hasn't actually stood in front of the Lord Jesus Christ to be judged for his life. But he will be. And we all will be. When we stand before the judgment seat, there's no defence. Everyone will be silenced. Our only defence actually is the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we might cling to him. You know, and how we think about Jesus now, how we judge Jesus today, will affect how we will be judged when we stand before him. So it seems that nobody wanted Jesus to be their king. The whole scene's against him. So whose king is Jesus? What did it say on the inscription? It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Jesus himself said that he came specifically to seek the lost sheep of Israel. Jesus is the King of the Jewish nation, the Jewish people. So does that mean that if I'm not Jewish, then he can't be my King? No. Nor does it mean that everyone who is a Jew will accept him as King. We only need to read this chapter to know that that's true. But as you look through the whole of the, the Bible, we see that the, the Jewish people always suffer with this problem of trying to throw God off their back from being king over their lives, that they wanted to be king themselves. Just as every human being has that tendency that we don't want Jesus to be king, we want to be king. And if Jesus can somehow serve us, then we're happy. So how is it? How can Jesus be the King of the Jews? Well, let me read a couple of verses from Romans. Firstly, Romans 9. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel, and not all who are children of Abraham, not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Romans chapter 2. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. So, Jesus is the King of the Jews in this bigger sense 
not necessarily on ethnicity or being guardians of the Old Testament law. But Jesus' kingdom comes to hearts that are surrendered to him, to hearts that have been changed, to hearts that want to, to live for him and love him and serve him and glorify him, hearts that have been born again by the Spirit of God. It comes through faith. Jesus is the king of those who belong to faith. Just as Jesus said to Nicodemus, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Pilate brings him out. And he says, Behold your king. Why was it that the crowd that day, the religious leaders, the Roman soldiers, why was it that they couldn't see who Jesus Christ truly was. Well, it's because Jesus is a concealed king. Do you remember the charge against him? It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. They didn't see because he's Jesus of Nazareth. Just a man from a common northern town in Israel. He didn't look any different. We read in Isaiah 53, he had no form, of no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. When Jesus goes back to his hometown, grown up there pretty much 30 years in Nazareth, and he goes back and he speaks in the synagogue, and it says in Matthew 13, they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these mighty works? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And you listen to their response. And they took offence at him. They took offence at him. They thought he was too common, too familiar. But this is Jesus of Nazareth. He had to come to earth to be our saviour. Despite the miracles and the teaching, they didn't see, really, because they didn't want to see. They didn't want to see that Jesus was the king of of heaven. Verse 14, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. We see how fickle the, the crowds were. As we look back in, in John's Gospel, in chapter 15, when it talks about Jesus feeding the 5,000, it says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. He'd fed them and they wanted him as their king. In the triumphal entry, as we think of Palm Sunday, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, the crowds are crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. So they wanted a king who fed them. They wanted a king who would sort out their political problems and make their nation great again. But it ended there. In effect, what they wanted was an earthly king. They didn't want a king from heaven. But some did. When we read the first mention of the word king in John's Gospel, right back in chapter 1, we read these words. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You know, God's got a way of gloriously opening someone's eyes up to see who Jesus Christ truly is. 
How we thank the Holy Spirit for his ministry in that regard. That without that grace of God, we'd just be like everyone else in that scene, shouting, crucify him, away with him. We'll have Jesus if he feeds me. I'll have Jesus if he sorts the world's problems out and we can live without God ruling over us, but everything's all right. We'll have that Jesus. But we don't want the Jesus who says, deny yourself in this world for the glories to come. But the Holy Spirit, he touches hearts, he opens eyes so that we can truly see who Jesus Christ is, so that we would give up everything for him because we've known a love that the world has never known. We've known that this King Jesus Christ has died for us in our place. What a glorious thing the Lord does. If you've never truly known that grace, ask him for that grace. Ask the Spirit of God to come and to touch your heart, to open your eyes up, to behold who Jesus Christ is. And so whether people saw him or not, the Lord of history pre preserves his testimony. The testimony of who Jesus Christ is, is preserved in history. Look at verse 21. The chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, I just, I just love this, but I'm glad John put this in the Gospels. I just love it. I don't know why, but I just love it. The chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. So there you go. It's written there. Latin, Greek, Aramaic. It's recorded in the history books. That Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. You know, a great comfort in that for us is that evil may prosper for a time. But Jesus is the Lord of history. His will, the Father's will, will always come through in the end. So don't, don't lose faith in those times. Jesus had escaped death many times, but this time, was the time for him to lay his life down willingly. No one took it from him. He was fully in control all the time. But this time, he willingly laid down his life. Verse 5. The chief priests answered him. Is that verse 5? Yeah. Chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So Pilate delivered him over to them to be crucified. Behold your king. Who is your king? Ultimately, it boils down to two options self exalted. Or Christ crucified? Who's your king? Is it yourself? Or is it Jesus? Two options with two fates. Christ as judge. Or Christ as saviour. How I pray for all of us that we would know Christ not as judge. But as saviour. Who is your king? Behold your king. When people look at your life, what do they see? Which king do they see you serving? Do they see you following the crowd, saving your own skin, living for this world? Or do they see you refusing to compromise your faith or to deny the Lord Jesus Christ, someone who is willing to lose everything in this life <clears throat> for the glory of God? And the hope of the resurrection. Who's your king? Well, may I encourage those who are truly serving the Lord to behold your king. To see the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who was rejected, the one who was mocked, the one who was ridiculed, the one 
who went through agonizing pain on the cross. The one who was buried. The one who rose from the dead. The one who has ascended and has gone to glory. To come back. He's coming back. To bring you. To share with him in his eternal kingdom. May you behold that king. The Lord Jesus Christ.